Okay, we're going to get started. Um, I'm Jim Hawk. I'm chairman of this organization. I'm also president of Hanover International. Um, we'll get into all that about the conference in the next uh, half hour. But this half hour, what we wanted to do, we kind of do like an educational type of thing. Um, some of what uh, is going to be said right now may not be applicable today, but it could very well be applicable tomorrow. And guess what? Knowledge about the financial industry doesn't hurt all of you, okay, as time goes on. Um, I want to introduce Andrea Catanio. Andrea is a partner in the law firm of Shepard Mullen, a uh, securities attorney. She's been on this street longer than I have, but she ages better. Uh, and I'd like to introduce Rich Krieger. Uh, Rich is a seasoned vet, uh, RHK Capital, been on the streets, done many a deal over the years. So those two will be conducting this meeting, and then I'll give a little uh, roundup talk about what to expect about tomorrow, questions you can ask me, uh, lay the format, what happens not only tomorrow, but in the afternoon, and then beyond because it's really important to understand the methodology of all this, okay? So with that, Andrea, Rich, the show is yours. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for that kind introduction, Jim. I'm Andrea Catanio. I know some of you. And I am a partner with Shepard Mullen. I also sit on the board of directors of the National Investment Banking Association. Very proud to be part of this organization. And you will see the board members tomorrow, you'll hear from Jim that part of our role is to make sure that you're all having a very effective conference. And we'll do whatever we can to make sure that you're meeting all of the you know, very important people that are going to be attending. So I, I passed around some information that Richard and I put together that, like Jim said, is about a product that uh, Richard and I had brainstormed about for companies that are public but can also be used in another variety for um, companies that are, that are private. And if any of you are familiar with Regulation A, I'll give you a very quick primer um, and interrupt me if you're bored and if you've heard all of this before. But in around 2012, end of 2012, and then implemented by the SEC in 2015, Regulation A, which is an exemption from registration, meaning you don't have to register the shares with the SEC before you sell them, was completely revamped and it's colloquially referred to now as Reg A+. And if you've heard about it, it's an interesting and worthwhile method to raise capital by accessing the crowd. Crowdfunding, many of you have heard of. This in particular was very interesting to securities lawyers who are always looking for ways to help our clients raise money. And with Reg A, you can use a general solicitation method. You can do things that you couldn't do for 80 years. Uh, according to the securities regulations. You can have a commercial, you can have a, you know, a billboard talking about your offering. And there are all kinds of regulatory requirements that you must follow in order to qualify and to be able to, to, to sell securities. Um, at any time during this, this conversation, we're happy to talk about crowdfunding, Reg A, 506C, which is another method for raising capital. It's an exemption for accredited investors only. And even Reg CF, if you're interested, regulation crowdfunding, it's a method to raise a million dollars. I'm trying to be um, conscious of the various stages that all of you may be in, in terms of raising capital, or I'm not sure where all of you are um, in your growth phases, but we're certainly available to chat with you about different methods of utilizing crowdfunding. Um, Richard Krieger is I think, practically famous for his rights offerings over the last, what, 10, 15 years, Richard? I think he's done more than anyone. And something that we discussed a while back, it seemed like such a logical thing to do. Now that Reg A is available also to public companies, 
was to put together um, a concept, and it's, it's, it's all out there for us, the, the rules and regs permit this, to do a rights offering for a company's shareholders. In other words, instead of just accessing the crowd, accessing the shareholders that you've amassed over time. And there's a method that Richard is gonna be happy to explain to you. Again, feel free to raise your hands, interrupt, um, let us know what your specific questions are because this particular capital formation method is available to public companies that are interested in raising money from their shareholders, but we both work with so many private companies and we could cater the rest of our you know, 20, 30 minutes to answering any questions if you prefer about raising money using, using crowdfunding or relying on other exemptions from registration. So I'm, I'm doing this 22 years. I have clients from all ranks, all different industries. I do like wellness. I am delighted about what's going on with cannabis and blockchain technologies. I see a lot of businesses are really developing and I'm so interested in uh, hearing all of you present tomorrow. So with that, I'm gonna pass the mic to Richard and uh, we'll continue in a sort of relaxed, informal manner, if that's okay with everyone. Great, thank you. I haven't heard myself in a speaker in years. Um, just a show of hands, who here has less than 10 shareholders in your company? Anyone here have more than 10 shareholders in their company? Anyone here have more than 100? No? All right, so, there you go. Do you guys have more than 500? <laughs> All right, so what's interesting is um, rights offerings date back to 1930, prior to 1933, but essentially what happened was uh, years ago, uh, before the 1933 Act, if you were an insider and you wanted to buy stock in, in a company, what you would do is you would essentially write terms to yourself and it didn't matter if those terms were better for your company um, or for your shareholders than for yourself. So you could actually just give yourself preferential terms. And in the 33 Act, they closed that loophole and basically said that if you offer to new shareholders the right to participate in the financing um, and you had preferential terms you were gonna offer to yourself, you'd have to share those terms with the rest of the um, the market of the people who are already, already shareholders. So if you have 500 shareholders or 100 or 10 or five, and you wanna do an offering, if you do an offering and don't offer your existing shareholders the right to participate, um, that could be a violation of securities law. So what happened was a whole body of law was created around rights offerings that made it easier to raise money from existing shareholders than from, uh, than from new holders. And the SEC, the IRS, um, FINRA, all the regulatory bodies, when you go to file these offerings, those offerings kind of go through the SEC much quicker than when you're offering something to new shareholders. So when you do a new offering to shareholders under Reg A+, the SEC treats it like an IPO, so they review it like an IPO document, but if you're already public and you file to do a rights offering, they treat it as, um, as a dividend, because rights offerings fall under the dividend laws. So what's interesting is, uh, there's a gentleman in the back that has over 500 shareholders. Let's say that you decided you wanted to utilize Reg A Plus to go public. And let's say that you've got over 500 shareholders, but half of them would like to invest in a new offering and half of them maybe don't have the money to do it or they don't like the company. Um, and, and you want to raise money and you want to go public. Um, a Reg A Plus rights offering is a great option for you because what we could do is we could uh, do an offering, we could um, build transferability into the rights and allow not only your existing shareholders to transfer them, but we could actually register all of the rights, make the rights tradable, um, similar to being like on a when issued basis, and then those rights could trade before you even go public. And people can buy those rights or they can subscribe for the rights. Um, what's interesting is under Reg A Plus, you can raise up to $50 million. Um, prior to 2015, the most you could raise is $5 million. So basically it's increased tenfold over the last um, 80 years. It only took, it took one second to increase it tenfold, but it took 80 years to get to that one second. I 
It's actually on its way to going up to 75 million. It's been approved by the House and the Senate, and it's just a matter of maybe, I don't know, another six months or a year, potentially, before that elevates to 60 million, or 75 million. So, so when it becomes 75 million dollars, that is going to be um, a bit of a game changer because larger and larger companies can do it. The other thing about Reg A Plus that's interesting is the ability to test the water. So you may say, well, you know, I'm interested in doing this, but I really don't know what the public will think. Um, I really don't know how my shareholders will react. What's good about doing uh, a Reg A Plus offering or a, re or a Reg A Plus rights offering is that you can circulate the offering amongst your largest accredited investors, get their feedback, and actually structure the offering um, to be accepted by the public. Um, one thing that also that's interesting is a lot of you are probably thinking, well, this doesn't apply to me. I've got eight shareholders or 10 shareholders. And you may be thinking about doing an IPO or doing a, uh, a reverse merger. You probably hear a lot of people this week talk, talking to you about reversing into a shell or into another publicly traded company. But what's interesting is those shells don't really have a lot of value if it doesn't have an active shareholder base. What's interesting is this new rule that really has only been effective since January 31 gives you the ability to, if you decide to go the shell route, you could merge your company into a shell. Let's say that shell has 500 shareholders. Now you're public and you don't have any liquidity, but you can go out and file for Reg A Plus for that new co, which is the shell merge with your company, and you can give everyone in the world the ability to buy your stock in the open market. Think of that as being a ticket. They're buying that ticket to be able to buy your stock in the open market. So if you have a business that's, let's say, weed board, that's probably a very big retail type of appeal. If you want to participate in the weed board IPO, all you have to do is buy this shell that's merged with weed board because you don't have a lot of shareholders. You merge with that shell with 500 shareholders. Those shares, those shares trade, right? The shell shares are free trading. And anybody who buys those shares before the record date of the rights offering can participate. And you can raise up to $50 million, soon $75 million. Um, maybe I'll hand this to Andrea to kind of, what, what you'll notice is I'll, I'll throw out ideas on how to raise money. She'll come back, if she's your attorney, if you're lucky enough to have her as your attorney, she'll come back and point out all the re all reasons, and pitfalls you might want to think about. So I'll hand it back to her a second so she can talk about maybe a little bit about gun jumping and. So I'm really glad that you brought up um, reverse mergers because some of you may have heard a lot of negative things. Um, years ago, we did as securities lawyers a lot of reverse mergers where you had a strong public company that was interested in accessing the capital markets and moving to um, a liquid market seemed like an eternity to accomplish. Six months is not you know, is, is an exaggeration of how short a time it's going to take. It's more like a year or 18 months to really organically build. And it was probably like a lot of things that happens in, in capital markets and with just raising money for private companies. It might have been uh, abused by some, uh, but um, if done the right way, it, it certainly is a shortcut to having a shareholder base. So that's one way to utilize the public company um, Reg A advantage if you are interested in um, accessing capital from your shareholder base. Um, I guess if we were to compare, and I want to kind of cater this conversation to most of the people in the room because there's just so, certainly so much that we can be talking about and I'm thinking more along the lines of private companies how Reg A sounded like such a great idea for an early stage company, but I would caution any very early stage company uh, against jumping into uh, a Reg A. Why? Because it's time consuming and expensive if you don't have a company that's generating revenues, if you have a company that doesn't have a consumer product or a fan base, a following of customers already, those are the best candidates for a reggae for a private company. It's not for any startup. It's not, 
you know, um, a new idea for an early stage. Maybe Reg CF, that's a crowdfunding for up to a million dollars. That might be viable for a startup company. Happy to chat with any of you about, about that. It's a lot less expensive. Uh, the average CF only raises about 250000 but at least you're not spending uh, the same amount of money as you would for a reg A. And believe me, I'm a fan, but it's costly. You need for tier two, there are two tiers with reg A for a private company, and it almost doesn't exist with, with public companies, the tiers. As long as you're public, you're eligible for, um, for, for reg A. But for the private companies, if you are interested in raising $20 million, you can do so under a tier one and not require audited financial statements. But frankly, tier one is very much like the old reg A that nobody wanted to use, the one that has been around for 80 years. Um, we took a look at I think from 2014 to 2016, the number of Reg D private placements that were done, and it was in the you know, tens of thousands as compared with the number of Reg A's that were done during that period. It was like less than 50. And there was a reason for that. It just, to raise $5 million with the old Reg A, you not only had the burden of all of that disclosure and having to have the SEC approve it in advance, you had a follow blue sky compliance. Every state where um, the investors resided, you had to file a copy of your Form D that you filed with the SEC, and a copy of your information circular would get reviewed by every state. So imagine you had you know, 15 different states participating. They all would get a say in your prospectus, basically, in your information circular. They could all have comments, and if you've ever gone through an SEC round of comments. Could you imagine deliberately going through an extra 15 reviewers? So you think it's saving you money. Tier one doesn't really save it. You're saving from the audited financial requirement, but you're taking on this huge, awful burden. So tier two is what we always recommend. But tier two, you can raise up to 50 million, eventually soon 75 million, but you must have two years of audited financial statements. And I'm a big fan of tier two reg A's for companies that have products, companies that already have customers, companies that have revenues, but not startups. Because you're spending money on two years of audited financial statements, you have to hire competent counsel who knows how to do these kinds of things. It's not, it's not cheap. I would not go with a, no offense to any solo practitioners, I respect them, but you need you need a firm with a little bit of a backbone. You need attorneys that know how to do this because there are a lot of pitfalls. There are a lot of things that um, experienced lawyers with a team can you know, look, out, look out for and they could guide you in the right direction. Um, but I don't want to be a naysayer. If anyone is interested in speaking more, uh, the ones that we've seen succeed are companies that have an affinity group. I have a client that, um, it's, it, it's funny, there's actually now more than one company in the Alzheimer's space, and I would have thought that might not be such a great candidate. It doesn't really sound like it would, but when you think about how many people it would appeal to, this technology, uh, everyone has a relative or a friend who's been affected. So they're exploring this as a real opportunity to market to their affinity group. Richard? Um, so from an investment banking perspective, when you're looking to raise money, you really have two options. You can stay private or you can go public. Right? You're either, and, you're gonna, and if you raise money as a private company, you've got two options. You can raise money through the public or you can, and stay private or you can raise money privately. Um, if you're a publicly traded company, you have those same two options. You can raise money privately or you can raise money through the public. But what's interesting about Reg A Plus in terms of a rights offering, because of the first, this is the first time in history that you can do this, you can actually do both. You can go out and privately source capital, and then you can do a public offering and test the waters and then launch your offering. And 
you used to be when you reverse into a shell, the biggest problem was you reverse into a shell, you're now public, but you have no liquidity. And okay, now you go and raise money, you hire an investment banker, and I go and raise you a couple million bucks, and it's institutions or hedge funds, and they own your stock, and then everyone complains that you know there's no liquidity. And then when they register the securities and then they go to eventually sell them at a profit, there's no liquidity. So the stock goes down because there's no liquidity. And so then you fast forward, well, let's go public and use Reg A+, um, which is great, but to do a Reg A+, you historically, prior to now, had to go and find a platform, like a crowdfunding platform to raise money through. The crowdfunding platform would have to have people registered for it. Maybe they have 50,000 people. Uh, if you're lucky, most of the crowdfunding deals are they're giving away some kind of widget with their offering. Um, so fast forward to where we are now, and think about this. If you merge with a publicly traded company, or you merge with a shell, and do a capital raise, now you're not pigeonholed into working with just a crowdfunding platform. Anyone in the country or the world that wants to participate in your public offering can do that just by buying your stock in the open market. So the big advantage of, the, of this platform and doing a Reg A+, plus, which is geared toward crowdfunding, and combined with the rights offering, is that anyone who wants to participate in your offering can, by simply going to their E-Trade or TD Ameritrade or Charles Schwab or Scott Trade account, and they can buy your stock and then subscribe through the offering, which is pretty amazing because rather than tapping those 50,000 or so people at a crowdfunding platform, you're talking about hundreds of millions of accounts where you could potentially market to. And under Reg A+, you don't have to blue sky the offering, which means that, you know, you're talking about states, but outside of those 50 states, you also have Puerto Rico, you've got Guam, you've got the US Virgin Islands, you've got Washington DC, so you've got 54 jurisdictions you'd have to register to raise money. Reg A plus preempts that. So that means that your filing with the SEC is your only filing, which means your legal costs are significantly lower. One other thing that Andrea mentioned was that if you file with these states, they may give you comments. And some of those comments may conflict. So for example, in some states, they may say the rights offerings need to be non-transferable. In California, they require that the rights be transferable. So you may have a document that's non-transferable except for California. You also may have a state like Florida may come back and say, you know what, we're not gonna let you sell your offering to retirees. We just don't think retirees should be in your offering. So anyone over the age of 65 can't participate. Or they may limit it to a dollar amount. Or they may outright reject you and say, we are not gonna allow you to do your offering. But under Reg A+, the states can't even comment. It preempts all of that. So you're just dealing with the SEC. It's not a merit review, it's just a securities review. Um, so they're reviewing it from a regulatory standpoint. So the, basically, it's a lot easier to raise money now than it was two months ago um, because of these new regulatory rules. And, and, and it's interesting because we lobby very hard to have Reg A plus change because prior to January 31st, if you wanted to do a Reg A plus, you had to be a private company. You couldn't be public. Now, you can be public and do a Reg A plus, which means that the universe of potential investors for your offering now is bigger than it's ever been, but only if you do it as a Reg A plus and do it as a rights offering. And the reason I say that is because if you want to do an offering that's not a rights offering and is not a Reg A plus, let's say you choose one broker dealer to work with, that broker dealer's shareholders are going to be the only shareholders allowed to participate in the deal. But if it's a rights offering through Reg A Plus, anyone who has a brokerage account at any broker dealer can participate. It's really, um, it's a wonderful time for private companies and public companies. There's just been so much positive change and it's important that all of you are aware of what your options are. You're not limited to just going to friends and family. You're not, you're not limited to um, just certain um, exemptions. 
And I think it's worth mentioning 506C in this context, because we're talking a little bit about crowdfunding. This is good for private companies and public companies. Utilizing the crowd, being able to access your existing shareholders, but this is really broad-based for only accredited investors. Um, you have the ability to advertise, to be on a platform, to put it on your own website. Excuse me, I have to cough. <coughs> I'm coughing the microphone. Um, you have more of a wide latitude of um, encouraging people to invest in your company in a way that hadn't existed for a very long time. And the whole process of um, qualifying investors does not have to be all that complicated. For those of you who might be familiar with the accrediting, the accreditation, if you will, of investors, making sure that they're, um, that they're, they're accredited beyond signing uh, an accredited investor questionnaire, bank statements, tax returns. You may hear about all of these things that these investors have to provide to prove that they're accredited. It, it doesn't have to be that, that complicated. Council can provide you with forms of letters uh, from the investor's lawyer, from the investment banker of the investor, from the um, accountant that uh, vouches for one's accredited investor status. So these are things that your attorney can help you with so that it's not as complex a, a process. But um, really, I guess in conclusion, oh, you know what, we've got, what's that? The one thing I want to say before you ask one question is, in terms of Reg A Plus, and she was just talking about what's called 506C, you don't have to do any of that. There's no reviewing of your financials. It's, it, anybody can participate in Reg A Plus. You can have $50 in the bank and participate in Reg A Plus. Whereas to do a invest in a 506C, um, which we're happy to do as well, you have to have a minimum of a million dollars outside of your IRA, outside of your mortgage. So 506 Cs, uh, probably in America, maybe maybe the top 2% can invest in a 506 C. Um, in a Reg A plus, anyone can invest. But don't forget though that for a Reg A plus, the company is gonna have to have a qualified offering. So you have to go through the whole SEC review process. 506C, you don't have to do that. You basically have a, a robust private placement that has all of the risk factors and all the exemption information, and you can go on a website, go on a portal, et cetera, and you don't have to go through the expense. So I guess they all have their advantages. Oh, questions. I think now is a good time to see if any of you have questions. I think we have some. Yeah, my question is this. We, uh, <clears throat> let's assume a uh, private offering in 2016. Mm -hmm. Five million shares at a dollar a share. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, well, let me see if I can do it this way. Uh, five million shares at a dollar a share. Okay. And the three years now, and everybody's all happy. Mm -hmm. The valuation has gone up five times. So uh, everybody's pretty happy about what they invested in, in, in early 16. Mm -hmm. We sold out the uh, private offering in about eight days for $5 million. And, and we aren't looking to raise a lot of money, but I've got a boss here. He says, well, we've got to raise some because we're going to franchise. We're going to, the growth is going to require some, some principal investments. But my question to you is, having done the private offering, mm -hmm. and now we want to go we want to be listed somewhere that my first investors, incidentally, four million of the stock of the five million shares are not for sale at five dollars. Okay. I mean, there might be a few small 10,000 shares, 20,000 shares. How many shareholders do you have? 27. Okay. So with 27 shares, you're going to need 50 shareholders if you want to be listed, if you want to trade anywhere. That's the threshold. OTC markets, if you wanted to start trading on the OTC QB, you need 50 shareholders. Okay. Even if you just wanted to stay on the pink sheets. And some companies are happy to start that Listen, way. Listen, I'm not opposed to that. How many customers do you have? Oh, 
1500 okay. So you might be a good bidders. candidate for a red. Well, they're all good and they're planning on they pre paid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so something that I think uh, Richard's itching to start talking about for your scenario is with 27 shareholders that have now held their shares for a few years, right? So they would be eligible for sale if you uh, file a Form 10. You don't even have to register their shares. If you were public, if you filed a Form 10 and you'd need two years of audited financial statements to do that, you would be a reporting company. Um, you'd be a 34 Act company subject to the the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934, so you'd have to file your quarterly reports and an annual report and 8Ks for every current event. I know, you're making a face. But then you could, if you wanted to, do a Reg A rights offering that would be available to your shareholder base and everyone else. And you would have the ability to bring in so many shareholders. Now, if you want to be listed on a national exchange, and you may not want that yet, but you're going to need more shareholders. Um, this is one way to really build that shareholder base and probably raise a lot of money. Because this, I don't know if you guys, you'll hear about this company tomorrow, but it is a phenomenal, uh, it's beyond concept. It is the alternative to... Uh, yeah, to a traditional cemetery, which many of us, you know, may be embarrassed to say, but when you go by a cemetery, don't you think, oh my God, what a waste of beautiful property. Um, this is gorgeous. It looks like a beautiful park. Why do you keep looking at me when you say that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think, um, I think Richard has, has a little bit to add to this because it's an exciting possibility for you guys. So as an investment banker, you typically ask like the typical questions of, you know, so you have 27 shareholders, you have over a thousand customers. Um, is there anything viral about your customer base that would make them want to participate in a company offering? Well, we have people that came to buy our product to invest in. You know, there's, you know, a number of them have asked, you know, can I invest in this? Because it is pretty new. Not the worst right, thing. and where, where are these kept? Are these kept at people's homes, or are they kept in public places, or the? It's a beautiful park. It's a, it's a, it's a cemetery. Network is a network of cemeteries. We currently have three functioning, and we'll have seven by the first of May or of June. We'll have seven cemeteries with a total of about one hundred fifty thousand plots. Now, when we valued it initially at a dollar a share. I have to admit, we probably have Okay. Well, well, we probably talk later. We, we should talk. I don't know if any, if, if the rest of you had a, a chance to hear that, but maybe we'll take one more question. And I think Jim wants to tie up soon, and I think cocktail party is starting soon. So, does anyone else have a question? We'd be happy to address it for you. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> All right, and it's got me.